Hello everyone, and welcome to the ACS Division of Polymer Chemistry's webinar series. I'm Mike David, and I will be your host for today's broadcast, which will focus on photochemistry. We are going to hear from two chemists, Brett Fors, an assistant professor at Cornell University, who will be discussing polymer synthetics, and Julia Kahlo, an assistant professor at Northwestern University, who will be discussing polymer properties. Our moderator today is Dr. Mark Hillmeyer, who is the past chair of the Division of Polymer Chemistry, as well as the McKnight Presidential Endowed Chair at the University of Minnesota. And now I'm pleased to turn the time over to Mark. It's really, again, my pleasure to host the sixth in the Division of Polymer Chemistry uh, webinar uh, series. As you heard, I'm, I'm finishing up my term with the official title past chair of the Division of Polymer Chemistry. And this was a series that we initiated in 2017 uh, with the idea being we like to bring content of the latest and greatest in polymer chemistry to a broader swath of folks interested who may not be able to attend, for example, ACS meetings where a lot of Polly's excellent programming takes place. So I'm very happy today that we have Professor Brett Fors and Professor Julia Kahlo to tell us about the action of light in polymer science and polymer chemistry. So let's get to the to the main event. Thank you, everybody, for again uh, logging in. Even the repeat attenders. I know some of you probably are back for a uh, second or third webinar, maybe all six. So I'm going to now turn it over to Brett, who's going to kick us off. Brett, it's all yours. Thanks, Mark, and uh, thanks for the invitation. It's it's nice to be here, and I'm I'm excited to kind of tell you about some of the like, polymer chemistry that we've been doing in my lab here at Cornell University. And today I'm going to kind of tell you some of what we think the opportunities in in using light to control polymer synthesis is. And, and where we think the kind of the new directions are. So before I do that, I, I just want to point out that the light is really a unique external stimulus. And um, it's been used a long time in, in polymer science. And, and so we're definitely not doing anything new here. We're, we're just trying to take it in new directions. But I think the reason for this is, is because it's easy to implement. It's adaptable, so you can change wavelength and intensity. And we think we can take advantage of that to control polymer structure. And, and people have already done this a lot. And so there's been a significant amount of taking advantage of, of these two properties. And then lastly, it provides spatial and temporal controls. Not only when you shine the light, but where you shine the light, you should get a, a transformation to occur. And so, like I said, this, this has been used in a, a number of applications, everything from stereolithography to dental fillings and coatings to self-healing materials. Because of this, there, there has been a, a lot of work. And, and, and the question is, you know, what else can we do with light? And, and so today I'll tell you about how we're trying to control polymer chain growth and how that's a little bit different from what has been done previously and, and, and really why I think there's a, there's a huge opportunity to, to, to be able to use these photocontrol polymerizations to control polymer structure. Before I actually get into the, the chemistry, I would like to just ask a question and, and kind of get an idea of where the audience is from and, and what types of fields they are from. So I will turn it over to Mike and have him do this poll question. This first one's kind of easy. Uh, it's just uh, which of the following is your profession? And we do have an other there for some of you that don't necessarily fit into this. So we have chemist, engineer, physicist, educator, or other. And with that, I am going to close this poll in five, four, three, two, one. And 78% of the audience said chemist, uh, 14 said engineer, uh, no physicist here today, 3% uh, educator and 6% other. So with that, I will turn it back over to you, Brett. Great, thanks. So yeah, it looks like I, I'm, I'm definitely a chemist by training, and, and a lot of the things we do is, is based on polymer chemistry, but we also want to understand how this, this works for properties as well. So um, with that, I, I kind of want to talk about, there's really two different types of, of photomediated polymerizations, and the first is photoinitiated polymerizations. And this is where a large majority of the, the research has been done, and, and photoinitiated polymerizations, you have an initiator, you hit it with a photon of light, and then this activated species starts polymerization. Now, the, the advantage of this type of, of process is you get chemical amplification. So for every photon that you put in, you get many chemical events. However, the one drawback here is that you only have control over the initiation. And so a lot of the work that's been done more recently, and a lot of the stuff that we do in our lab, is, is trying to develop photocontrolled polymerizations. And what I mean by that is we want each one of our monomer additions to be mediated by a photon of light or, or around a photon of light. And the reason we want that is then you can control the rate of polymerization by, say, the light intensity that you put in or the amount of light you put in. And this also allows you to, to say, stop one type of polymerization and apply a second stimulus and maybe get to structurally control polymerizations just by changing your, your external stimuli. 
the, the tool that people have used in the last few years to really develop these photo control polymerizations, or one of the tools, are these photo redox catalysts. And there's some really interesting species. I put up a couple examples here. And the reason they're interesting is because they undergo a, a metal ligand charge transfer when they get excited by visible light. In the excited state, they can be both strong oxidizing agents as well as strong reducing agents. And the important thing is you can precisely control the, the, both the excited state redox potentials as well as the ground state redox potentials by just changing the, the structure of these materials. And so using that, you can theoretically precisely control polymerization processes. So using this, in the last few years, people have developed a number of photocontrolled radical polymerization. So I just put up a, a few examples here. And the first ones are, are photocontrolled atom transfer radical polymerizations by the Hawker group and the Matyszewski group. And really, these are, are, are very nice examples of, of being able to control polymer chain growth with light. So you can control the rate of polymerization by the amount of light that you put in, um, and, and you get very good spatial and temporal control. And then the second set is this, this photo-controlled uh, electron transfer reversible addition fragmentation polymerization, or pt wrap that has been developed by the Boyer Group and the Johnson Group. All of these processes give you excellent temporal control. And because of this, there has been a, a lot of research in this area over the last few years and, and really taking advantage of the spatial and temporal control. So I just wanted to put up one example of how you can take advantage of that. And this is a, an example by the Hawker group where they were able to pattern polymer brushes in a, in a single step. So you can imagine if you put a, a, the initiator on a surface and then you may start growing the polymer brush from the surface, your final brush length is going to be directly proportional to the number of photons that reach the surface. And so let's say if you use a, a grayscale photo mask, you can make three-dimensional polymer brushes in a single step. Really taking advantage of the, the spatial and temporal control provided by these, these photocontrolled polymerization processes. Now, the one thing that, that we started thinking about when we started at Cornell is how do we go beyond radical polymerizations? Because if you look in the literature, the large majority of these photocontrolled processes were all radical. And one thing that we really would like to do is develop a photocontrolled cationic polymerization. And there, there's two main reasons we want to do this. So first of all, it's going to extend the scope of, of these processes, right? Because there's a number of polymers that you can polymerize via a cationic mechanism that you can't polymerize via a radical mechanism. And, and kind of the second reason we want to develop a photocontrolled cationic polymerization, and, and this is kind of one of the grand challenges in our lab, is, is can we use the stimulus to, say, switch between a, a cationic chain end and a radical chain end to, say, can change monomer selectivity in situ and, and get control over, over polymer block structure or, or possibly even in the future over polymer sequence. And so it could be a really powerful type of method. But before we start thinking about that, the first thing we need to do is, is develop a photocontrolled cationic polymerization process. Now, cationic polymerizations in, in material science are, are really important, especially photo-initiated cationic polymerizations. So these are already used for a number of applications, whether it, it's coatings or photolithography, and the majority of these are, are initiated by UV light. Now, more recently, uh, a number of researchers have actually pushed this into the, the visible region. So I just put up a couple examples by the Shevitz group and the Spokoini group, where they do photo-initiated cationic polymerizations um, using these photoredox catalysts. But again, these are only you only have control over the initiation event. And so the question is, how do we gain control over chain growth and get to a point where each one of our monomer additions or about each one of our monomer additions is mediated by a photon of light? And so in a very cartoonish way, this is, this is what we needed to, to develop. We needed something that, in the absence of light, we have a stable and dormant polymer chain end. And when we hit this with light, we need to generate a cation. And that cation has to go into a controlled cationic polymerization. And then when we turn the light off, this needs to go back into the stable and dormant chain end and, and give us the same species. So somehow we need to photoreversely generate a cation with light. So when we first started thinking about this problem, we had several strategies to try and tackle this, but one of them was this, this oxidation mesolytic cleavage strategy. And it was really inspired by this work back in the early 1990s by Maslik and Narvarez, where they have this interesting bifunctional molecule that has an electron donating group and an electron withdrawing group coming off of it. And they can chemically oxidize this to form the radical cation. And then this radical cation very quickly undergoes what's called a mesolytic cleavage to generate a stabilized cation as well as a stabilized radical species. And what we asked is, can we do this photoreversibly with light, right? So if we use a photoredox catalyst, we should be able to do two electron transfers and, and actually make this photoreversible. And if we design our bifunctional molecule right, and after the mesolytic cleavage, 
If the cation, we can shuttle into a controlled cation polymerization, that could work well. And if the radical we form is stabilized enough that it doesn't uh, do an addition to an olefin, that, that would be ideal. Because if it does an addition to an olefin, we're going get, to get radical polymerization as well. How do we shuttle this cation into a controlled cationic polymerization? And we were really inspired by this work by Kamigaito, where they, they developed this cationic raft or reversible addition fragmentation chain transfer polymerization of vinyl ethers that was initiated by, by a strong acid. Now, the, the reason we really like this polymerization process is because at any one time, the concentration of your propagating cation is incredibly low, so in the parts per million range. And because this addition fragmentation, so addition to our chain transfer agent or this dithiocarbonyl to generate the stabilized cation followed by fragmentation to, to generate the active chain end again, because that's so fast, all of your polymer chains grow at the same rate. So what we asked is, can we somehow photoreversibly shuttle in a, a very small amount of cation into this process? And if we can do that, we can, we can basically develop a, a photocontrolled cationic polymerization. Now, the other thing we really liked about this Kamigaito chemistry is, is we thought we could use their chain transfer agents or these dithiocarbamates as our bifunctional initiating species that I alluded to earlier. So you can imagine in the presence of a, a very oxidizing photocatalyst in the excited state, this dithiocarbamate should get oxidized to the radical cation. And then this radical cation, you can imagine, should very quickly undergo a mesolytic cleavage to generate an oxocarbenium ion. And this oxocarbenium ion is basically the chain end for the, or the living chain end for polymerizations of, of vinyl ethers. And so this should go into our cationic raft type polymerization and give us a controlled polymerization process. And then the radical we form should be this dithiocarbamate, which should be relatively stabilized and not do a fast addition to an old. Now, what we propose is that our reduced photocatalyst will come back in, reduce our radical to the anion, which then can cap our propagating cation and get back to our stable and dormant species that's now capped with our, our polymer chain. This also regenerates our photocatalyst, and then this whole process can be mediated by an additional photon of light. And then if we turn the light off, we no longer have the photocatalyst in the excited state, and so all of our propagating cations should feed back to the stable and dormant species. If we then turn the light back on, we reinitiate the polymerization and, and everything should start again. Now, the other thing that I, I'd like to point out here is that our propagating cation or the concentration of cation in solution should be directly proportional to the amount of light that we put in our, our light intensity. And so this should allow us to, to control the rate of polymerization by the amount of light that we put in. So we should have perfect temporal control over our, our chain growth process. So this was our, our hypothesis. So to test this, uh, a graduate student, Veronica Kodish, in my lab, started looking at the polymerization of, of isobutyl vinyl ether using this dithiocarbamate, which I'll call 2A, as, as both our chain transfer agent as well as our, our initiating species. And then we looked at a number of, of very oxidizing photocatalysts in the excited state. And, and the one photocatalyst that gave us polymerization was this trimethoxy perillium catalyst. And it was the only one that gave us any conversion of our monomer. But more excitingly, I guess, is, is when we actually isolated the polymer, our experimental and theoretical molecular weights matched up very nicely. So what this suggested is that each one of these chain transfer agents or each one of these dithiocarbamates is leading to a new polymer chain, and this possibly could be a controlled polymerization process. Now, the other thing that was encouraging is that our dispersity was relatively narrow, about 1.29, and so this suggests that we, we did have a controlled polymerization process going on. Now, Initially, these polymerizations were relatively slow, but we're using very small amounts of catalysts, so 0.01 mole percent. And, and so to accelerate the reaction, all we had to do is go up to, say, 0.02 mole percent. We could run these to full conversion within just a couple hours, and we got excellent control over our polymerization process. And then if we just simply change the, the ratio between our initiator, our chain transfer agent, and our monomer, we could dial in any molar mass that we wanted. And so this is just a characteristic feature of a controlled polymerization process and really showed that we had a, a, a controlled polymerization. Now, just control experiments, without any light, we didn't see any polymerization. Without any catalyst, we didn't see any polymerization. And then interestingly, without chain transfer agent, we actually saw uncontrolled polymerization. And so what we think is happening here is, is the trimethoxyphenylperillium is, is incredibly oxidizing in the excited state. So it has an excited state potential of about 1.8 electron volts. And so we actually have good evidence that it will directly oxidize the isobutyl vinyl ether in the absence of the chain transfer agent and just lead to the radical cation, which gives us uncontrolled polymerization.
So everything I've shown you so far is, is that we have a, a new control cationic polymerization process that is at least mediated by light. But the real question is, is do we have temporal control over chain growth? Can we reversibly turn on and off this polymerization with light? And can we control the rate of polymerization with the amount of light that we put in? So to test this, we take our standard conditions and we turn the light on and polymerization starts. If we then turn the light off, polymerization stops, and we can do this multiple times. Each time in the light, we see polymerization. Each time in the dark, we don't see any background polymerization. Now, the other thing I would like to point out is we don't lose control over the polymerization process when we do these multiple cycles. And so this suggests that when we turn the light off, we're not irreversibly terminating our polymer chains. And so this suggests that we have good temporal control over, over polymer chains. Now, the other thing is if we look at the initial reaction rate and change our light intensity, we find that we're first order of light. And so this shows that we can precisely control the rate of polymerization by the amount of light that we put in. And this opens up a number of, say, patterning type applications and, and really further shows that we have good temporal control over polymer chain groups. So the next thing is, is we can run these to full conversion, which is really an advantage over, say, radical polymerizations. And, and so we can grow, say, a polyethyl vinyl ether block, and then we can simply subject this to the same reaction conditions and grow a second block of polyisobutyl vinyl ether. We have excellent chain infidelity, so we have greater than 95% chain infidelity after the first polymerization, and then so you can actually take advantage of this to make good functional materials. So it's not just a photo control polymerization, but it also has living characteristics. Okay, so there's a, a, a postdoc in my group, Quentin Mayshaw-Dell, went and, and did a, a full mechanistic study on, on this catalytic cycle. We have pretty good evidence for each one of these steps in the catalytic cycle. So I don't have time to, to go through this full study today, but I just wanted to give you kind of one idea or one story of how we use these mechanism-guided studies to develop a, a new improved catalyst system. So one of the, the issues with our, our first-generation catalyst is that prillium decomposes during the reaction. And this, is cause, this causes loss of temporal control at high conversions over long dark periods because anytime you have a catalyst decomposition event occur, it basically locks one of your polymer chain ends in, in the on state. And so the more catalyst decomposition, the more background or, or dark reaction we see. And what Quinton found is that small changes in our, our catalyst structure greatly affected the temporal control of these polymerizations. So here if you can see the, the the trimethoxyphenyl perillium, we get excellent temporal control, and, and if you looked at the quantum yield, we get about six monomer additions per photon absorbed. Now, if you just change the catalyst slightly and remove the methoxy substituents and go to this triphenyl perillium, what we found here is that we, we still have very good, fast, photo-initiated polymerization, but we don't have photo control. So we can't turn the light, or when we turn the light off, the polymerization continues to go. And, and so if you looked at the, the quantum yield in these cases, we get about 35 monomer additions per photon absorbed. And then so the question is, is why is this? What, what's this small change in catalyst structure? Why do we not get temporal control over polymer chain growth? And so what we think it actually is, is, is the ground state redox potential or the recapping of that, that propagating polymer chain. In. So the trimethoxyphenyl perillium has a ground state redox potential of about negative 0.5 electron volts, whereas the, the triphenyl perillium has a ground state redox potential of, of negative 3.1 electron volts. And so this lower uh, reduction potential actually leads to poor or, or less efficient recapping of our polymer chain ends. And, and so when we turn the light off, polymerization doesn't stop. Now, from some photoluminescence quenching studies, the other thing we found is, is that we needed an excited state redox potential of about 1.5 electron volts to do that oxidation of the dithiocarbamate. And so based on this, we were able to identify a new catalyst system that we, we hypothesized wouldn't decompose, but had these correct uh, redox potentials to allow both oxidation of the chain end as well as recapping of the chain end. So taking advantage of this information, Veronica Kodish in my lab identified this, this reading-based catalyst that had the, the correct redox potential. So the excited state redox potential was about 1.7 electron volts, and the ground state redox potential was about negative 0.69 electron volts, and, and so she showed that this gave excellent temporal control, and because these iridium complexes are much more stable than the perillium-based complexes, we can now turn these off for, for long periods of time and turn them off at, at very high conversions. And, and so, so a, a much more stable and, and well-behaved catalyst system. Okay, so, so we've developed a new photocontrolled cationic polymerization, and one of the things I mentioned to you that, that our group was really interested in is can we take advantage of this temporal control to actually control polymer structure? And specifically, can we somehow use the external stimulus to change the, the nature of the propagating chain end to change monomer selectivity? 
So we just showed that if you oxidize the chain and you generate a, a cation and do a, a photocontrolled cationic polymerization, and Boyer and, and Johnson have shown that if you reduce the chain end, you generate a radical species and you do a photocontrolled radical polymerization. So if we put two photocatalysts in the solution, one that can oxidize the chain end and one that can reduce the chain end, can we switch polymerization mechanism by just changing which of the photocatalysts we excite? And this should allow us to get to structurally controlled polymerizations by simply just changing our external stimulus. So the first thing we need to do to, to test this type of hypothesis is to see if we can use our thioacetal chain transfer agents as initiators for radical polymerizations. So basically we took our standard conditions and we replaced the isobutyl vinyl ether with methyl acrylate, which polymerizes via radical mechanism. And then we simply replaced our, our perillium with iridium pippi, which is incredibly reducing in the excited state. We radiated with blue LEDs and we got a very well controlled, photo controlled radical polymerization process. And you can see our experimental and theoretical molecular match up very nicely, and we got a narrow dispersity of 1.26. So this just suggests that, that after we're doing the, the cationic polymerization of the vinyl ether, we can very efficiently initiate a radical process or a radical polymerization from that gene end, and so we should be, be, be able to do a, a cationic polymerization followed by a radical polymerization. Now, the other thing we needed to test is, is whether the radicals that were forming in our cationic polymerization process would initiate a radical polymerization. Because from ESR studies, we know we're generating radicals, but our hypothesis was that those radicals should not do a fast addition to an olefin. And so to test this, we take our, our standard cationic polymerization conditions, add in one equivalent of methyl acrylate, which will polymerize via a radical mechanism, irradiate with blue LEDs, and we only see polymerization of isobutyl vinyl ether. And even after 24 hours, we see absolutely no conversion of the methyl acrylate. And so this is exciting because this suggests that the, the radicals that we are forming in solution are, are not going to initiate the radical polymerization process. Now, the other thing we really liked about these two photocatalysts is, is that there's this very small window where we hypothesize that we could irradiate with green LEDs and selectively excite the perillion catalyst, and this would allow us to selectively promote the cation polymerization process. Then if we switch to blue LEDs, we should excite both the perillium and the reading complex and, and basically promote both the radical and the cation polymerization at once. Okay, so to test this, we put everything into the solution. We have both photocatalysts, the perillium and the reading complex, and, and both the, the monomers, isobutyl vinyl ether and methyl acrylate, as well as our, our trithiocarbonate chain end. And when we only radiate with green LEDs, we see just homopolymerization of the isobutyl vinyl ether. Now, if we take the same reaction and after 80% conversion of the isobutyl vinyl ether, we switch from green LEDs to blue LEDs, then we start exciting the iridium-based complex. We initiate the radical polymerization, and you can see the conversion of our methyl acrylate starts, and we make this nice, well-defined dialogical polymer. So this was incredibly exciting because this was our, our first example of showing that we could switch polymerization mechanism by just changing the wavelength of, of light or just changing the external stimulus. And in the last example, if we take the same solution conditions, but we simply just irradiate with blue LEDs, we actually get a multi-block copolymer. So on average, this is a pentablock copolymer, and both of the, the photocatalysts are excited in this case, and so it's just stochastically switching back and forth between the cationic mechanism and, and the radical mechanism. So this is interesting, but we don't have good control over our block lengths or the number of blocks. So there could be some dye block in here, and there could be some deca block, and then the block lengths for all of these are, are very different. And so the question is, why is that? How do we gain precise control? Because what we'd like to do is, is be able to control the, the actual length of each one of the blocks in our final polymer. And we'd like to also control the switching fence. And the reason we can't do that with this system is because when we irradiate with blue LEDs, we excite both photocatalysts. So they're not orthogonal. And so the question is, how do we get around this? How do we get perfect switching and actually get, gain control over our, our block type structure? And so what we thought is we need to get away from these photo-photo systems. Um, and so if we want to do photo-controlled radical polymerization, can we develop a, another cationic polymerization that's mediated by a, another orthogonal stimulus? And so really pairing photochemistry with some other type of stimulus control. And the stimulus we chose was, was chemical control. And, and so the Byers group and the Diakonescu group have showed that chemical control can be very powerful in, in polymer synthesis. And the question is, is can we replace our photocatalyst with just some type of, of chemical stimulant? And so what we hypothesized is that, that we should be able to use ferricinium to initiate our, our, our cation polymerization. Because you can imagine if you add in a small amount of ferricinium, 
This should very slowly oxidize our, our polymer chain in, or our dithiocarbamate to the radical cation, which then is, is the same as our other mechanism where it undergoes the mesolytic cleavage to generate our stabilized cation as well as our stabilized radical and go into our RAF polymerization process. Now, if we want to turn this polymerization off, all we have to do is simply add in the equimolar amount of the dithiocarbamate, which will cap all of our propagating cation back to our stable and dormant species, as well as reduce any remaining ferrocinium back to ferrocene and, and, and basically completely halt the polymerization process. So to test this, we, we basically took our standard conditions, but instead of putting in the photocatalyst, we just simply added in 0.01 mole percent of our ferrocinium. And we got very well controlled polymerization. So you can see experimental and theoretical molecules match up very nicely. And, and we had a really narrow dispersity of 1.1. And the other thing that's nice is that we can effectively turn on and off this polymerization by just alternating the addition of ferrocinium or the dithiocarbamate anion. And, and so we really have very good control or temporal control over chain growth with this, with this external stimulus. Now, the other thing I'd like to point out really quickly is, is this is a really robust polymerization process. And the scope of these polymerizations is, is actually really broad. And, and so this is a really easy way to do these, these cationic polymerizations. And the other thing I'd like to say is, is they are, they're not very sensitive to, to things like moisture or oxygen. So we can do these polymerizations open to the air and, and maintain control, which is, uh, which is really quite interesting. OK, but now that we have this, this orthogonal stimulus, can we pair this with a photocontrolled radical polymerization process and switch back and forth between the cationic polymerization and the radical polymerization and get control over our, our block structure. Now, there's one thing that I haven't been telling you, and, and, and that's that switching from the radical polymerization back to the cationic polymerization could be difficult. Because you can imagine, after you do the polymerization of methyl acrylate, oxidation of the methyl acrylate chain end of this trithiocarbonate to generate a, a cation alpha to the carbonyl is going to be incredibly high in energy. And this is the case. So if you actually grow a homopolymer of polymethyl acrylate, and then you try and initiate the cationic polymerization of isobutyl vinyl ether off of that, you actually get no chain extension. You only get homopolymer of the polymethyl acrylate and the polyisobutyl vinyl ether. And, and so the question is, how do we get around this? Well, it turns out when we're doing our polymerizations with everything together, we will get some small incorporation of the isobutyl vinyl ether. So when we have an equimolar amount of, of methyl acrylate and isobutyl vinyl ether in our reaction, and we're doing the radical polymerization process, about 20% of the time, we're going to incorporate the vinyl ether in via a radical mechanism. And if you think about the kinetics of our, our RAF process, or our fragmentation process, fragmentation towards the thioacetal is going to be much slower than fragmentation to give the radical alpha to the carbonyl or alpha to the ester. And so because of that, if you look at the chain ends during any time of the reaction, the majority of your chain ends are actually based on the thioacetal. And so the resting state of our chain end effectively is the thioacetal, and that should allow us to initiate the cationic polymerization off of these chain ends. And so to test this, we, we put everything together now. So we have both monomers, the chain transfer agent and iridium pipi. We irradiate with blue LEDs. We grow a polymethyl acrylate block with a small amount of incorporation of isobutyl vinyl ether. We then turn the light off. And then we add in ferrocinium to initiate the cationic polymerization, and we get very nice chain extension. And so this shows that we can actually take advantage of the resting state of those polymer chain ends and initiate a cationic block or an isobutyl vinyl ether block off of our polymethyl acrylate block. So with this in hand, this should allow us to actually switch back and forth between the two polymerization processes at will, and that's exactly what we can do. So if we focus on B here and we look at this first tri-block, what we can do is we can do a, a radical followed by a cationic followed by a radical polymerization process to make a well-defined tri-block. And if we simply want to make the opposite tri-block, where we first do polyisobutyl vinyl ether followed by, followed by polymethyl acrylate followed by isobutyl vinyl ether, we just switch the order of stimuli that we do. So we can do cationic, radical, cationic, and we get a very well-controlled tri-block. And we can even go up to, say, a, a tetra-block copolymer. So I would like to point out here that, that the length of each one of our blocks is, is dictated by the amount of time we apply a stimulus. And the number of blocks is basically dictated by the number of switching events we put in. And so this really shows that we can precisely control the, the final structure of our polymer by just simply changing the stimuli that we apply. And, and so this is, is, is really just starting to scratch the surface of how we take advantage of, of two different orthogonal stimuli and basically pair light with something else to actually control polymer structure. 
And so right now we've just shown it for plot structure, but you can imagine this could be very powerful to, to control polymer architecture, as well as maybe in the future to, to control sequence control polymerizations. And, and so we think this really has a, a, a lot of opportunity in, in controlling polymer structure in the future, especially with this idea of pairing multiple stimuli in a single reaction mixture. So the last thing I need to do is, is thank my group. So I have a, a, a fantastic group of students and, and postdocs. Um, so the majority of the photocontrolled cationic polymerizations was done by, by Veronica Kodish. The chemically controlled polymerizations were done by Brian Peterson and, and Michael Supe in my lab, which are both graduate students. And then a lot of the mechanistic work on these, on these processes was done by my postdoc, Quentin Meshadel, who's now a, a faculty member at Texas A&M. So I just wanted to finish here by, by saying thanks to Mark again for this opportunity, and, and thanks for everyone for, for tuning in. And I will pass this over to Mark to, uh, to, to introduce Julie. Brad, thank you very much. We're definitely getting questions coming in uh, about your presentation. Fascinating control of block and uh, structure of polymers by these orthogonal processes. Really uh, quite interesting, Brad. Thank you. So with that, I'm very happy to introduce Professor uh, Julia Kahlo from Northwestern University, who's going to tell us about photo control of polymer properties. Julia, please. Thank you, Mark, for the introduction and this opportunity for me to share my group science with a broader audience. So today I'm excited to tell you about the principles behind photo control of polymer properties and some examples, including um, from my own lab. Brett's talk was a really nice introduction to the advantages of using light as an external stimulus. So just to review, of course, we really like to use light as an external stimulus because it offers spatiotemporal control. And as he just showed so beautifully, you can turn light on and off. And you can also use light to pattern, for example, using masks or rastering a laser. And additionally, um, as again, Brett showed very nicely for polymer synthesis, you can tune the intensity of the light and the wavelength. And this latter aspect we think is particularly exciting because different wavelengths of light are associated with different amounts of energy. And particularly when you compare this to chemical reagents, this really is a nice way to control over a very wide range, the amount of energy you're, you're delivering to your system. Um, and you can also do so in a continuous fashion. To start us off, I actually have a challenge question. Um, this will partly be a test of how well you've paid attention during Brett's presentation. So I will turn it over to Mike. All right, so our question for all of you is which of the following is an application of photo-controlled materials? And you can select more than one of these, so click away to your heart's content. Is it transition sunglasses, dental fillings, silicone microchips, or none of the above? And just a reminder, we are still eager to get your questions, so keep those coming in. And I will close this in five, four, three, two, one. And it looks like 81% uh, said dental fillings, uh, silicon microchips got 49%, and transition sunglasses got 57%. Only six said none of the above. So with that, Julia, I'll turn it back over to you. So the answer was all of the above. So um, all three transition sunglasses um, experience a change in color, and that's actually due to a small molecule which is embedded in the polymer that makes up the sunglass material. Dental fillings, as Brett mentioned, are another example of a change in mechanics um, using light. So this is specifically the composite dental fillings that are white, as not the mercury, mercury amalgam fillings. So that allows you to take something that's moldable and turn it into something that has mechanics similar to that of teeth. And as many of you know, probably silicon microchips are another example. Photolithography is used to change the solubility of polymeric materials, and that actually enables the very um, precise patterning. So there are, of course, many, many other applications of using photochemistry to control the properties of polymers. So Brett mentioned 3D printing, and there's many others that I won't have a chance to talk about today. So for all of these technologies, really the key ingredient is some sort of molecule that changes in some way when it absorbs light. So that's pretty general, but I'll give you a couple of examples. We'll focus today on three different mechanisms of change that can affect the properties of a polymeric material. The first are photoinitiators. So this is something that Brett alluded to. This is some molecule that can absorb light. And when it does so, it generally reacts or fragments to form a radical initiator or a cationic initiator. And either of those can then go on to initiate a polymerization. So I'm just showing one example here of a common um, initiator that uses UV light to then undergo a homolysis that generates radicals that can then initiate a radical polymerization. 
Another example that I'll touch on is photocages. So these are generally some sort of molecule that have a portion, a dye portion, that can absorb light. And when it does absorb light, that leads to a fragmentation, often here a heterolytic fragmentation, to release a leaving group, which I've shown as X, and that could be many different types of heteroatoms generally, such as an alcohol, carboxylate, and so on. So I've shown one of the most common photocages, the ortho-nitrobenzyl group. And then I'll also talk about the type of photosensitive group that my group uses in our research, which is a photo switch. And this is some sort of species that can absorb light. And then when it does so, it undergoes an isomerization. So actually, I've shown here the molecule that is, uh, this is the type of molecule, not the exact structure, although you can probably find that through looking by looking through patents, which is behind the color change in those transition sunglasses. So you can see in this particular case, when the molecule on the left absorbs UV light, um, which comes from the sun, it undergoes this isomerization that leads to a more conjugated form of the molecule, which then absorbs visible light, which is how it acts as sunglasses. So you might not only get a change in color, but also a change in the dipole moment, in unveiling of functional groups, and so on, which you can then use to alter the properties of a polymer. Um, another class that I won't have time to discuss today are photocycloadditions, and those are also a very powerful class of reactions that are mediated by light, and these can actually be reversible, but unfortunately I won't have time to talk about that today. The focus um, of our research and what I'll talk about today are polymer networks. So what Brett really told you about was focused on polymer strands, so polymers that have some finite molecular weight, they could be branched, they could be stars, they could be brushes, but still the molecular weight is finite, even if very high. This means that these polymers can be soluble and they can flow, often at a higher temperature. So what I'll be talking about are polymer networks, which is when you connect the polymer strands in a way that you essentially have infinite molecular weight. So when I draw these, it's always going to be very difficult to exactly depict what infinite molecular weight looks like because, of course, um, my screen is finite. But um, you can imagine that all these ends here could be connected to the rest of the network. So one characteristic of polymer networks is if you have permanent covalent linkages between the strands, these are insoluble and they cannot flow. So when you have these permanent covalent crosslinks, these are referred to as chemically crosslinked polymer networks. However, you can also have polymer networks that are physically cross-linked, which means the interactions that hold the strands together are reversible. So some very common examples might be hydrogen bonding or metal ligand coordination. I've showed here the key components of a polymer network. So you have your polymer strands, and then these are linked by junctions. So the key sort of feature of a junction is that it has a functionality of greater than two. So you can think of any point along the polymer strand, of course, is only linked in two other directions, whereas the junction has to have at least three strands emanating for it to, for it to function as a junction. You can also have defects in your polymer network such as a dangling end or a loop. And those are actually going to take away from the elasticity of the network because they don't contribute to the overall network structure. When we think about polymer networks, there's some aspects um, that are quite intuitive, but it is helpful to actually look at an equation for the shear modulus or this G quantity. So the shear modulus is a, a measure of stiffness. And it can be expressed if we assume that the polymer strands are acting as Hooke's law springs. We can express that stiffness as a function of several variables. For example, the density of your network, ideal gas constant, absolute temperature. And of course, the one that we're going to really care about is this M sub X, the molecular weight between junctions, because that's really what we're going to be able to change with light. For example, if you take two different polymer networks, this one here and the one on the right, which has, you can see, more closely spaced junctions. You can look at this and you can imagine if this was actually a net, say like a fishing net, say, um, one would be easier to deform than the other. But we can also look at this equation and understand that the one on the left has a greater molecular weight between those two junctions. So that means that the quantity on the denominator is larger and the stiffness is overall lower, whereas the one on the right has shorter distance between crosslinks, and therefore we're going to get a higher modulus and stiffer network. So I have a challenge question to see how you've been able to think about this, um, and I will turn that over to Mike. 
Uh, which network would be the stiffest? Would it be A, B, C, or D? I'll let you uh, think of that to yourself. And Julie, I think I just have to turn this one back over to you really quick. Okay, well, hopefully you got the right answer, which is C. So the reason is C is the stiffest is it has the shortest distance between these junctions. Another way to say this is it has higher cross-link density. So it also has the fewest defects because as I mentioned, um, these dangling ends and loops do not contribute to the overall network elasticity and they lower the stiffness. So C would therefore be the stiffest network. So some of the data I'll show um, is rheology, and based on Brett's poll, it appears that many of you are chemists. So I'm going to give you a chemist guide to rheology, both for chemists and also by a chemist. So I will have to warn you that I am a chemist, so this is how I understand it from that background. So the word rheology comes from the Greek panta re, or everything flows. We in particular use a lot of shear rheology, so you can imagine taking a material such as this block and shearing it, from this top. So there are a couple of key um, variables that we look at. The shear stress is basically the applied force normalized by area. The strain is the distance that you are able to deform it uh, normalized by height. And the modulus is basically um, how much force it took to deform it by a certain amount. So you can imagine that something stiffer will take greater force to deform. However, that just looks at what happens when you immediately strain the material. And it's also important to think about what happens as a function of time. For a purely elastic material, like a rubber band, when you first pull it, you can imagine this in your hands, the rubber band maintains that energy. Basically, when you release the rubber band, it snaps back into place. This means that the energy is being stored by those permanent covalent crosslinks. On the other end of the spectrum, you can have basically a liquid, so a perfect liquid, you can put your hand through it and it immediately moves out of the way. So it doesn't store any of the energy at all. Many polymer materials of interest are viscoelastic, meaning they have some elastic character and some viscous character. So you can apply a strain and over time, the energy will be dissipated because these reversible covalent crosslinks in the network can rearrange and accommodate the stress that you've applied. So the materials that we're interested in have this property of viscoelasticity. So the instrument that we use to actually measure this is an oscillatory rheometer. So you put your sample in the rheometer. Generally, you have a temperature controlled bottom plate and a top fixture, which is able to rotate. Um, and you can control how much it's rotating and the rate of rotation. And through these measurements, you get two key quantities. One is the storage modulus, and that relates to how elastic the material is, so the ability to store energy. And you can think of this as the solid-like component and then the loss modulus, which tells you about um, the ability of the material to dissipate energy or its liquid-like or viscous portion. So one of the types of experiments that you'll often see in photorheology is looking at G prime and G double prime as a function of time. For example, in many of these photo-initiated gelations or photopolymerizations, you will, for example, start off with a liquid at the time zero, and you know it's a liquid because basically the G double prime is higher than G prime. Then you will exert your stimulus, which in our case will be light, and then you'll start to see the G prime, the solid-like portion, increase until it's greater, and the point at which they cross over can be called the gel point. So this is very useful in photorheology for looking at light-controlled materials. You can also vary the frequency. So this is how fast you're rotating the rheometer. And if you have a purely elastic material like that rubber band, it doesn't matter how fast you're rotating it, you will get the same G prime and G double prime. However, if you have a viscoelastic material, the stiffness will basically depend on how quickly you're rotating. So um, Silly Putty is a really good example of this where you can imagine bouncing it and there you're using a very fast stimulus where the bonds don't have time to rearrange, or you can imagine just holding it so it flows like in the previous picture, and now the bonds have time to rearrange and it acts more like a liquid. So the frequency at which you see that crossover from more solid-like to liquid-like is called the crossover point, and that can be characteristic of the material and um, the interactions holding it together.
So um, now I'll talk about some examples of those photo controlled components of a network that you can use to make photo controlled materials. Brett alluded to photo initiators, and I'm going to focus in particular on radical photo initiators where you shine light on some sort of molecule and it fragments. And I'm showing four examples here. There's many more, um, but these are some commonly used ones. And you can see that actually the wavelengths that are used to activate these molecules can vary. So you can imagine that this is potentially useful if you want to get um, orthogonal stimuli in the same material. One common way to create a polymer network with light is to use one of these photo initiators, combine it with a monomer, such as a methacrylate, as well as a crosslinker. And the crosslinker is any sort of molecule that has two or more reactive groups. These will create your junctions. So when you shine this with light, the initiator is formed, then that starts to do radical polymerization. And the majority component is your monomer that polymerizes um, as a linear strand. And every so once in a while, it will incorporate your crosslinker to create a junction. So going back to thinking about how we might control the properties of a material, one thing you can do is increase the amount of the crosslinker that creates more of these junctions, and then you get a stiffer network. Another example of a reaction that can rely on photoinitiators is thiolene chemistry. This takes advantage of the reaction of a thiol with a radical initiator to create a thiol radical that can add across a double bond. So again, now you can think about rationally changing the mechanics of your network, for example, by using a longer molecular weight between your two thiols. And then if you use longer molecular weight, that will result in a softer network. OK, so that's one way to form networks using light. What about cleaving networks? A common way to do that is using photocages. These are often heterolysis reactions. And there's a ton of photocages out there. I'm going to show a few. As I mentioned, these nitrobenzyl ones are extremely commonly used. They do generally require higher energy light, though you can make some modifications to move towards blue light. And then this coumarin derivative, um, you can again use even longer wavelength light. I also wanted to highlight two more recent photocages. This one, um, this benzoquinone derivative, which my group recently published, which you can activate with red light. And our Winters group at Iowa has been doing a lot of really nice work with these Bodipi derivatives, which they've been able now to even push towards near IR light activation. This is also really exciting because the quantum yields of those are really quite good. So the latter two actually have, to my knowledge, not yet been incorporated in polymer networks, but you can imagine doing so if you were able to design them as linkers. So one example of how you can use a photo cage in a polymer network is if you build up a polymer network, such as the one I've shown here, and these junctions are linked by this green portion, which on either end has a photo cage. So when you shine UV light or blue light on this network, it will start cleaving at these groups to break apart the network. I have a challenge question which is taken from work in the ANSETH lab. And you may notice I'm including a lot of um, examples from the ANSETH lab because I really like their work. So I'll turn it over to Mike. So just a quick question, what is happening in the following figure? And of course, to look at the figure, I'm not going to launch the interactive portion for just a moment. Um, is it that a network is being formed, the network is getting softer, the network is getting stiffer, the color of the network is changing, or the network, unfortunately, has caught fire? And it seems like everyone is it's kind of a runaway on this, so I'm going to close this poll in five, four, three, two, one. Great job, guys. So as you can see, this decreasing G prime storage modulus shows that the network's getting softer. Um, excellent. The last example I wanted to show, which is relevant to our research, is the use of photo switches for reversible control. So as I mentioned, these are molecules that isomerize, and this can happen reversibly, meaning that if you hit the product with a different wavelength of light, it returns to the starting point. So this can be quite useful. There are a lot of very commonly used um, photo switches, including these diphenyl ethenes, spiropyrans, which open up to form this highly colored myrocyanine, and azobenzenes, which are one type of photo switch that we use in my group. So one example from the literature I wanted to highlight that uses azobenzenes in a polymer network is from the Harada lab. 
So I've shown it just schematically here, but basically the azobenzenes in this trans configuration are able to fit inside um, a cyclodextrin host. So when this happens, um, this allows you to form a network if you've grafted your polymer chains with both azobenzenes and cyclodextrins. Then when you shine UV light, that causes the isomerization of the azobenzene to the cis configuration, and it no longer fits nicely inside the cyclodextrin that breaks apart part of the polymer network. So this is one way to reversibly stiffen and soften a network using supramolecular interactions. One reason that my group is interested in this general area is because we are interested in designing photocontrolled materials that can um, recapitulate the extracellular environment. In particular, we're focused on synthetic hydrogels because it's possible to create these polymer networks and swell them in water such that they have mechanics as well as water content that are very similar to tissue. And the applications of these can be, for example, 3D printed organs, as well as just creating um, substrates to grow cells in that more faithfully um, recapitulate the tissue environment, which can be useful for a lot of different biological studies. In particular, we and others want to use light because tissue is heterogeneous and dynamic. And this is particularly true when you're thinking about disease states and development. So I've shown one example that I like. Um, you can see the development of an embryo, a chick embryo. And it actually turns out that as this embryo develops, um, the tendon changes its mechanics. So these are data from the Kuo lab at Rochester um, who were able to look at different developmental stages and show the tendon material is becoming both more heterogeneous and stiffer during these developmental stages. So you can imagine being able to imitate this transition using light. So the final aspect that we're interested in being able to imitate is the fact that tissue is viscoelastic or structs relaxing. So if we were to create a hydrogel that only had permanent covalent bonds, it would be elastic like a rubber band. And then the cells would not be able to, in the same way, deform their environment. So instead, we want something that's viscoelastic. So I'm showing here um, actual mechanical data from different types of tissues, which shows that the stress can be relaxed on different time scales, unlike a covalently cross-linked hydrogel. And actually the time scale of how quickly this relaxation occurs can actually control cell fate. So the Mooney lab at the Wies Institute has shown um, that, for example, stem cell differentiation can be controlled by the stress relaxation rate, which I think is really cool. So when we approach this problem of how can we use light to actually control a stress relaxing hydrogel, we had four requirements. One is that we can only use chemistry that is cytocompatible. Another is that we wanted to use interactions to hold the network together that are reversible so we would get a stress relaxing hydrogel. Another is that we wanted to use visible light for control, since again, this is more cytocompatible. Finally, we didn't want to um, consume any reagents or generate any high harmful byproducts. We really wanted this to be fully reversible. So we thought a good way to do that would be to use a photo switch. Our approach was to basically design a network that combined photo switches in dynamic covalent bonds. So our thought was that these dynamic covalent bonds are inherently reversible. And perhaps if we attach a photo switch, we can then control the thermodynamics or kinetics of this dynamic process using light. So the dynamic covalent bond we have focused on is the bronic ester. And this is because it is, has been shown to be cytocompatible and it is also compatible with aqueous environments. Basically, you have a bronic ester, which can reversibly undergo hydrolysis and then re-esterification. And this is the process by which you can exchange your bonds in a network. So it's well established that an adjacent base, basic amine to the bronic ester can alter the thermodynamics and kinetics of this hydrolysis and esterification process. So a student in my lab who's in my first class of students had the very excellent idea of rather than using a basic amine, could we actually use a photo switch? And he envisioned that perhaps the photo switch and the trans and cis configurations would actually behave differently in terms of assisting in this, this hydrolysis process. 
So in terms of the synthesis, since you're chemists, I don't want to dwell on this too much since this is published as well, but basically we are able to build up the key building blocks, which are an azobenzene boronic acid, where we have positioned the boronic acid ortho to the azobenzene, so we can make that through condensation and then a series of deprotections. Then this carboxylic acid can be appended to our forearm peg using an amide coupling reaction. And then we can make this dial terminated species simply by opening up gluconolactone with, again, this forearm pegamine. Um, and I do want to notice that the use of this carbonyl was deliberate because this electron withdrawing group on the azobenzene means that the Z um, isomer of the azobenzene has a relatively long half-life of almost a day. Whereas if we increase the electron density of that substituent, the half-life becomes much shorter. So you can imagine that would be potentially less useful if you had to use more continuous irradiation. Joe could take these two components and mix them together in phosphate bu buffered saline. So we are using an aqueous environment. And initially when he mixed together his dial terminated polymer and his bronic acid terminated polymer, they remained a liquid as you can see from this very fancy flow inversion test. For a while he was very frustrated because he couldn't figure out why it wasn't gelling, but then he had the good idea of actually shining light on it. So we're using UV light, which will isomerize from the trans to the cis, and as you can see, the material gelled. So we can take that same hydrogel and now shine blue light on it. And you can see that now we've now been able to return the hydrogel back to the liquid state. So this reversibility was really what was exciting to us. So we could quantify what we'd observed in a qualitative sense using photorheology. So it's similar to the setup I showed before, but now we're shining light from the bottom. So when we turn on the UV light, you can see that the material stiffens. We can also look at the temporal control of the system by switching between UV light and blue light. So the UV light is stiffening um, as we go to the cis confirmation. And then when we use blue light, we isomerize back to trans and it softens again. So we can do, we've done, I believe, seven cycles for this. I also talked earlier about the types of experiments we can do in rheology. So I'm showing here a frequency sweep where um, with increasing amounts of irradiation, we do see increased stiffening, but this crossover point, so that transition from the solid light to liquid like occurs at the same crossover frequency, which we thought was very interesting. So another way of saying this is that the stress relaxation is constant, even as the stiffness is changing. And that's something very interesting that we've been able to separate these two um, mechanical parameters, stiffness and stress relaxation. To understand the system a bit better, we wondered whether the structure we'd chosen was important. So we made different molecules as controls. One is that we could move the bronic acid from the ortho position to the para position. The other is that we could remove the bronic acid entirely. So interestingly, when we move the bronic acid to the para position, we see a non-photoresponsive gel. So um, basically, it's a gel in whether or not we shine light on it. And when we move the, remove the boronic acid entirely, we only see a liquid, which is again, not photoresponsive. So these data supported the idea that proximity is important for the boronic acid. And furthermore, the boronic ester is the elastically effective crosslink in the network. So one thing you may notice is that we had to use UV light, which is very much non-ideal. Since then, we've been able to actually change the structure of the azobenzene so very slightly, just adding these fluorines, and now we can use green light to stiffen, blue light to soften. Again, you can see that change visually. We can also see by photorheology, and we actually got some other nice advantages through this design. We see much faster gelation, um, and we also get a much stiffer gel. So before our maximum stiffness was only about 200 pascals, now it's about 2,000, so that's very exciting. And again, this material is still viscoelastic. So we're very excited about that. And this is the, actually the type of material that we're moving forward with in cell studies because we can use visible light. Just to show briefly, um, so I showed temporal control. Um, I also wanted to show that these materials, not surprisingly, are self-healing because of the dynamic bonds. And we can also exert spatial control. So if we take a piece of the hydrogel and irradiate each side differently, by nano-indentation, we can see that the stiffness is different on each side.
One question I get often is about the stability of the gels. So these are stable for at least a week in the dark. In terms of the proposed origin, basically we understand that in the E conformation, it's a liquid. So we probably have these soluble polymers, whereas in the Z conformation, it's a gel. So we are probably forming crosslinks. The way we think about this is that th these species, these boronic acids are in an equilibrium where in the E conformation, likely we are favoring the acid side, which is not cross-linked. And in the Z, the equilibrium favors the ester, which is the cross-link. To provide better evidence for this hypothesis, um, we did some small molecule studies. So we can actually take mixtures of the E and the Z bronic acids and in a competition experiment, subject it to a dial. So we can also use a dial more similar to the one that's our end group, but I'm just showing here ethylene glycol. So this sets up this equilibrium where we can form a mixture of the ester and the acid. And by fluorine NMR, we can actually separate all these species and we can integrate these to show that the relative binding um, constants are as we expect, favoring the ester for the Z conformation relative to E. So as we suspected, the Z is a better binder for the dial than the E conformation. As this backs up our control experiments, basically when we have the para substituted boronic acids, these are not photoresponsive because the E and the Z bind approximately equally. With that, I just wanted to conclude by giving you some key takeaways. First is that, as both Brett and I have shown, light enables spatiotemporal and tunable control of properties. And I've also shown examples of photoreactions that allow you to photocontrol mechanics by increasing or decreasing that molecular weight between crosslinks. And in particular, in our research, we can combine photo switches with dynamic covalent bonds to enable reversible um, photocontrol in a stress-relaxing hydrogel. Some opportunities and challenges for those of you who are in the field or interested in doing work in this field. One is that there is always interest in using visible and near IR light. And the challenge here, of course, is that these wavelengths have even less energy associated with them. So it's often harder to do productive chemistries. Another sort of constant challenge is um, issues with penetration depth. Because of course, when you do have absorbing species, we all know the Beer-Lambert law, the light can't penetrate through necessarily far enough to get the change in properties throughout a material. So there are various ways to um, deal with this problem. Um, for example, two photon approaches is one. I'm in particular interested in photocontrolling properties beyond stiffness. So my group would tell you a particular obsession of mine right now is the idea of actually photocontrolling stress relaxation, but there's many other properties you could envision. So I'd just like to conclude by thanking you for your time. All the work I've talked about today, um, aside from, of course, other literature, um, and there is a reference slide on the next slide, but the work from my group was all performed by a uh, graduate student, Joseph Accardo, and of course, funding in particular, we're involved with two different NSF centers for chem chemical innovation, which are interested in polymer networks, the Center for Sustainable Polymers and the Center for Molecularly Optimized Networks and I will turn it back over to Mark. Julia, thank you very much. A fascinating presentation, uh, particularly this isomerization of the azobenzene with boronic acid is really quite a uh, creative and interesting way to be able to control the, the properties. Thank you for that. Also, that was the uh, very first chicken in a poly webinar, so thank you for that as well. I'll give Julia a little break here while, while Brett has been waiting patiently. I have uh, plenty of questions for you, Brett, so I'll start out with a couple for you. Anath men, uh, asked the question, you mentioned the polymerization uh, isn't all that affected by moisture or air, but do you have examples where you could do some of these controlled, let's say, switchable polymerizations in, in aqueous media? Is that a possibility? Yeah, so go going to, to aqueous media becomes a little bit more difficult. So when I say mm -hmm. they are, are, are not sensitive, especially these cationic polymerizations are not sensitive to moisture, we can run them open to air, but if we run them in in water, it, it's, it's, it shuts them down relatively quickly. Although there are examples, there are a few examples of cationic polymerizations that are done in aqueous media. There's potential that we could we could go that way. We just need to somehow mask the chain end or that that the active oxocarpenium line. So it's possible, but not with what we've done so far. Helen asks. In the iridium, in one of the iridium cases anyway, uh, you're using extremely low catalyst concentrations. 
what what are the limits? How low? I, th I think I'm remembering point zero zero five mole percent or something like that. What are the limits in those systems? Yeah, that's a that's a really good question. So the catalyst concentration is actually it, it directly affects the control in these systems, especially for the radical polymerizations. Because what you can imagine is is the catalyst concentration is going to lead to the concentration of propagating radical. And so if, you're, if your radical concentrations are actually too high, you can start to get termination events. And so, so one way you can control that is actually to lower the catalyst concentrations. And the best way to get to control in these systems is to, is to actually go to really low concentrations. Um, if you go to lower concentrations than what I showed, the polymerization starts to become incredibly slow. And, and you might also start to lose some, uh, a little bit of control. But there's kind of a sweet spot. So it's not just the, the rate of polymerization, but it's also the control that goes in there. I understand. Um, is uh, Alan asked the question, what about the uh, quantum yield of these photocatalysts? How, how is that impacting the overall process? Yeah, so quantum yield of, of these processes is, is incredibly important. So I mentioned on that on the one slide. So for the photocontrolled cationic polymerizations that we developed, we are, are anywhere in the region of, say, one monomer addition per photon absorbed to about six monomer additions per photon absorbed. And those, those are what give us good temporal control. So when we turn the light off, polymerization stops. Now, I also showed that the triphenylperillium, those don't give us temporal control. They still give us control polymerization. And those, those quantum yields are up around 35 monomer additions per photon absorbed. And so when you turn the light off, the polymerization continues to propagate. And that's kind of in, in between uh, what a typical photo-initiated polymerization and a photo-controlled polymerization is. So, just to, as a reference, a, a photo-initiated polymerization usually has about 200 monomer additions per photon absorbed. And, and mm. so we want to be down around, say, one photon for every, every monomer addition, and that gives us kind of the best, the best example. We can go lower than that, but then our polymerization starts to become extremely slow. Got it. Understood. Understood. Uh, Julie, I'm going to come over to questions about your presentation now. This is a question from Wei. How is this the biocompatibility of these azobenzene units? And is that something you have to worry about, or is that an issue in these systems? Thus far, we have not observed any issues. Um, and others who've used azobenzenes and other types of designs have also not seen a problem. Um, I would think the main issue is if you do have to use UV light. And while small molecule azobenzenes may have some, these are commonly used as dyes, including, I think, food dyes. But, I mean, you might be concerned with small molecules, but once it's attached to a polymer, I don't think you have to worry about that as much. I see. Okay. Kathleen asks, at constant cross molecular weight between crosslinks, ever compare or is there a way to compare stiffnesses coming from the, the chemistry of the crosslink part? Meaning how important in your systems is the actual crosslinking chemistry relative to the molecular weight between crosslinks? Oh, that's an interesting question. That was a tough one. That's why I asked that's it. Yeah. Level. Yeah. So, I mean, one thing we have done, uh, so Mike Hor at Case Western helped us do some SANS which did support the picture I uh, presented. So it does suggest that we're going from more dissolved species to more of a network. So that would suggest in our case that it is because of the change in the crosslink density. You can envision some cases though, where the specific crosslinks you choose could change say the persistence length or something like that. And then the chemistry might matter more. Okay. But yeah, great question. Okay. This, it was one more. This is a specific question about the boronic acid uh, derivatives. And I th I'm trying to remember exactly what part of the presentation this was referring to. But why is only one wavelength red shifted when you change the substituents on the boronic acid? So I'm not oh, great question. So when we start out with the regular azobenzene, just the parent azobenzene, we're irradiating with UV the pi to pi star to go from trans to cis and then to go back from cis to trans. You're Irradiating the n to pi star. So the pi to pi star is in the UV, the n to pi star is in the visible. Um, and the reason you can't use n to pi star for both directions is that those overlap too much. So what adding those fluorine groups does, it actually separates the n to pi star transitions. So basically in the E to Z direction, the trans to cis, now you are irradiating the n to pi star, which is now red shifted into the green. And then to go backwards, you're still basically irradiating the same n to pi star you were before. I see. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Brett, I'm going to shift back to you. There's a bunch of questions coming in here. Um, this is from Jack. 
are these light induced reactions in your hands? I imagine you're doing them on lab scale here, but are they batch size limited? And what kind of mass can you yield in these reactions? Yeah, that's that's a really good question. So anytime you try and scale up these these photopolymerizations, you could run into problems, especially if you think about a lot of these photocatalysts that we use have really high extinction coefficients, so the, the majority of the light is is absorbed in the right at the at the very beginning of your reactor. So if you increase your reactor size and you don't have good stirring, that could lead to increased dispersity. So the one way that, that people have gotten around this, so the, the Hawker group and the Miyaka group have actually shown that you can do these polymerizations in flow. And, and I think that's going to be the key to, to scaling these up. Because in flow, you can actually have uniform light penetration, and, and you can also accelerate reactions by having higher light intensities throughout and, and get really good control. And so right now, if we go above, say, 10 grams, um, this could become an issue. This is from Gia. Why did you choose the iridium catalyst rather than some other photocatalysts that, that have less overlap with the PY catalyst? So... The idea here is uh, you had something about, you know, trying to have minimize the overlap between wavelengths and absorption features. Uh, do you have other options there or is that uh, you have some limitations there? Yeah, no, that's a, that's a really good question. So originally the reason we chose the, the reading-based catalyst is because they're incredibly stable, especially compared to these other organic-based, say, the, the phenothiazines that the Hawker group has, has done. And, and so it was just as a first go, it was easy to use. So we could go to some of these other ones that are, that are definitely blue-shifted. The issue there is if we want to get perfectly orthogonal photocatalysts, it's going to be difficult because we also have to take into account the fact that you can get energy transfer from one photocatalyst to the other, which is, is still going to promote both polymerization processes. And so actually finding a, a photo photo system where you can do both the cationic and the radical polymerization process, we, we have not been able to identify two photocatalysts that can do that yet. And that's where we, we try to take advantage of going to a, another stimulus. But if, if, if anybody can identify two photocatalysts that can do that, I think it would be incredibly powerful. Yes, you can find Brett's email on the website of Cornell yeah. Department of Chemistry. Please email him directly. Julia, um, so this uh, concept with the beta cyclodextrins, uh, Amal asked, could you talk just a little bit more about that with the beta cyclodextrin? Is this something that you're pursuing as well, or is this something you're just showing as, a, as an example with the azobenzenes? Right, so the Harada example is just an example I wanted to show that took advantage of these photo switches to control uh, photo control stiffness. So we are looking at host gas chemistries in entirely different contexts, but not um, in this the context of hydrogels. Okay. Jordan asked, what UV light source was used? This is a technical question here. What UV light source was used for this reversible hydrogel experiment? Was that something that was easy? We saw a picture of it, kind of. Can you explain a little bit more about that? Yeah, it's really just a little UV flashlight from Amazon. Um, like oh, okay. <laughs> uh, I don't know, clubs, I assume. <laughs> I wouldn't know. <laughs> so, yes, it's, it's a very readily available UV light source. And um, once we were moving fully to visible, we can just use LED strips from superbrightleds.com. That's not an endorsement, but that is where we go. <laughs> We've endorsed two companies in one answer. That's good. <laughs> uh, so, uh, okay, so these are things that are read. I guess the point is they're readily available. Yes, and easy readily available under $20. Okay. Dollars. Yeah. <laughs> okay, all right, relatively cheap. Okay, good. Now, John asks, Julia, how fast are the photo cage dynamics going from the on to the off state? Uh, you worry about rates, I guess, of these processes. Do you have a sense of that? Okay, so the cysta trans isomerization itself is pretty fast, but we are definitely then limited by the chemistries themselves, um, as well as, of course, I guess, having to think about the diffusion of these polymers um, in the medium itself. So as you can see, I mean, it does take a matter of about 30 minutes in our, our fluorinated system to get to full stiffness. Um, but I don't think that's coming from the actual dynamics of the azobenzene photo switch itself. It's just coming from the chemistries and the fact that the on and off rates of forming the bronic acids and dials, I think that's more limiting. As well as the actual depth, I mean, because we are using macroscopic samples on the rheometer, so it does take some time for the light to penetrate through. Okay, I'm going to do one last question here, and this is from, from Way again. Uh, are, there, are there side reactions you have to worry about in these uh, photo switches that have troubled you or plagued uh, some, of the, some of the responsiveness of the materials? Yeah, so azobenzenes are actually extremely well studied. Um, they're quite robust photo switches, and that's why people use them in so many applications, such as surface relief gratings and other things, um, liquid crystal type applications. 
For our first initial system, though, um, we did actually see at longer radiation times with UV light, we started to see deborylation, um, which I think was because of the relatively high energy of that light. Um, but now that we've moved to visible light, that's no longer a problem. Great. Well, thank you. Uh, there are some questions that are going to go uh, unanswered, but I would expect that both uh, Brett and Julie will be willing to take your questions uh, by, by email. So I want to thank Brett and Julie, both fascinating presentations and the power of light and polymer science is really, you articulated that very uh, clearly from the synthetic to the material side. I really appreciate it. I also want to thank all the attendees for showing up uh, to this uh, poly webinar. It's your membership dues uh, going to good cause here. And if you're saying to yourself, I'm not a member of poly, well, we can change that. Uh, so please note that the first year membership is, is free for the division of, of, of polymer chemistry. So with that, I'm going to sign off and turn it back over to Mike to wrap up the webinar. All right. Well, thank you so much, Mark. And as Mark just said, there are many benefits to being a member of the Division of Polymer Chemistry, including access to technical programs, discounts on workshops, and much more. Remember that, as he just said, the first year is free. If you'd like to learn more, you can reach out to Kathy Mitchum at the email address on your screen. Also, remember that this recording will join all of the other recordings uh, on YouTube. So that wraps us up for today. We thank you so much for joining us and have a good afternoon.